first bar, second bar, third bar. So you all have the chanting book, huh? Okay, take one more. So. <coughs> Start off with the Namo Tassa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama. Sambutasa Bhutang Saranang Gachami Tamang Saranang Gachami Sankang Saranang Gachami Dutiyam Ki Bhutang Saranang Gachami Dutiyam Ki Tamang Saranang Gachami Tatiyam pi sangkang saranang gacami Tatiyam pi buddhang saranang gacami Tatiyam pi dhammang saranang gacami So we jump to the page 3, eh? The Buddha wandana. Iti piso bhagava arahang sama sambuto Vijacarana sampano sugato loka vidu Anutaro purisadama sarati Sata deva anusana puto bhagavati Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sandhitiko Akariko Eipasiko Opanaiko Pachatam Veditamo Vinyuhiti Supatipano Bhagavato Savakasanko Ujupatipano Bhagavato Savakasanko Yaya Patipano Bhagavato Savakasanko Samichi Patipano Bhagavato Savakasanko Yadidang Chattari Purisayukani Atta Purisapuka Esa Bhagavato Savakasanko Aruneyo Bahuneyo Dakineyo Anjali Karaniyo Anutara Punya Ketang Loka Sapi Okay, then we turn to this Ratana Sutta Page fifteen one five one five eh Ratana Sutta. So we are just going to read the English. Yeah, since some of you don't know the chanting. Okay, read together. Whatever beings are here assembled, whether terrestrial or celestial, may all these beings be happy. And listen closely to my words. Pay attention, all you beings. Show kindness to the humans who day and night bring you offerings. Therefore, guard them diligently. Whatever treasure is here or beyond, or the precious jewel in the heavens, none is equal to the perfect one. In the Buddha is the precious jewel. By this truth, May there be well-being. The calm Sakyan sage found sensation, dispassion, the deathless, the sublime. 
There is nothing equal to that state. In the Dhamma is this precious jewel. By this truth may there be well-being. That purity praised by the Supreme Buddha, called concentration with immediate result. That concentration has no equal. In the Dhamma is this precious jewel. By this truth may there be well-being. With firm minds applying themselves to Gautama's teaching, passionless, they reach the goal, plunge in the deathless, they enjoy supreme peace. In the Sangha is this precious jewel. By the truth, may there be well-being. As a firm post grounded in the earth cannot be shaken by the four winds, so is the superior person, I say, who definitely sees the noble truths. In the Sangha is this precious jewel. By the truth may there be well-being. Those who comprehend the noble truths, taught well by him of deep wisdom, even if they are very negligent, do not take an in existence. In the Sangha is this precious jewel. By the truth may there be well-being. For one who has attained to vision, three states are at once abandoned. View of self, doubt and clinging, to needless rules and rituals, free from the four states of misery. He cannot do six kinds of evil deeds. In the Sangha is this precious jewel. By the truth may there be well-being. Though he might do some evil deed by body, speech or mind, he cannot hide it. Such is impossible for one who has seen the path. In the Sangha is this precious jewel. By the truth may there be well-being. Like woodland groves in blossom, in the first heat of the summertime, is the sublime Dhamma that he taught leading to Nibbāna the highest good. In the Buddha is this precious jewel. By this truth may there be well-being. He, the supreme sublime one, knower, giver and bringer of the sublime, taught the sublime Dhamma. In the Buddha is this precious jewel. By the truth may there be well-being. Their past is extinct with no new arising. Their minds not drawn to future birth. Their old is destroyed. Desires no more growing. The wise go out just like this lamp. In the Sangha is this precious jewel. By the truth may there be well-being. Whatever beings are here assembled, whether terrestrial or celestial, we salute the perfected Buddha, revered by gods and men. May there be well-being. Whatever beings are here assembled, whether terrestrial or celestial, we salute the perfected Dhamma, revered by gods and men. May there be well-being. Whatever beings are here assembled, whether terrestrial or celestial, we salute the perfected Sangha, revered by gods and men. May there be well-being. By the power of this truth, May my suffering subside. By the power of this truth, may my fear subside. By the power of this truth, may my illness subside. Okay, turn to page 7. Eh? <coughs> this uh, transference of merit to the devas. Akasata chabumata devanaga mahitika Punyang dang anumodi twa chirang rakatu loka sasana Akasata chabumata devanaga mahidika Punyang dang anumodi twa chirang rakatu desana Akasata chabumata devanaga mahidika Punyang tang alu modi twa chirang rakan tu mabarang. Page 9. Eh? Blessing to the world. 
devo vasatu kalena sasa sampati hetu cha pito bhavatu loko cha raja bhavatu dhamiko idam vinyati na hotu sukita hontu nyatayo idam vinyati na hotu sukita hontu nyatayo idam vinyati na hotu sukita hontu nyatayo imina punya kamena mame bala samagamo satang samagamo hotu yavani bana patiya kaye na vacha chitena pamade na maya gata acaya kama me pante uri panya tata gata kaye na vacha chitena pamade na maya gata acaya kama me dhamma sandi tika akarika kaye na vacha chitena pamade na maya gata acaya kama me sangha supati pana anutara sadu 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 okay so we continue our session eh? yeah so now is this uh, <coughs> question and answers <coughs> so i'll just yeah So, so. <coughs> Carry on. Okay. So today's uh, selection choice of chant, uh, chant this Ratana Sutta because of this uh, <coughs> interesting quality. Yeah. <coughs> If you look at page fifteen, verse five. Verse five. This Ratana Sutta, <clears throat> the purity praised by the Supreme Buddha, called concentration with immediate result. That concentration has no equal. Right. So this is the <clears throat> uh, questions a few people asked this uh, earlier session. Yeah. So uh, Tan is asking about the lights. So I talk about uh, there's another kind of samadhi, and uh, I think uh, go right, yeah, same surname. <laughs> so he's uh, asking about the different levels of concentration. So today I'm going to introduce uh, this particular sutta because not many people are aware. Not many people are aware there's this uh, teaching called the samadhi sutta. Yeah, the Buddha taught there are four different kinds of samadhis. Four different kinds of samadhi. A lot of people, uh, when they hear samadhi or hear concentration, people have the idea. Concentration means must must enter total stillness, quietness, no thinking. Your brain ECG stop, your heart stop, everything stop, uh, breathing stop, everything stop. Ah, uh, then this is concentration. Um, not necessarily true. So we'll go into that. So there's one type of concentration may lead to this. May lead to this. So we'll talk about that later. Um, so there are four kinds of concentration. So the first kind of concentration is the jhanas. So jhanas is um, there are total eight kind of jhanas. Yeah, eight kind of jhanas. So the first jhana, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight. So total there are eight levels of concentration. So this concentration is to make a person calm. Make a person contented. So that's the purpose of these uh, jhanas. So the purpose of samatha meditation, uh, yeah, let's say we are doing this uh, uh, loving kindness meditation. So we introduce a bit uh, based on this particular metang sutta. If there's an M behind the metta, uh, a person do wishing all beings well and happy can enter the first level of concentration. If they add the insight meditation. They combine inside, it will jump to the fourth. So one and four. Four, one and four jhana. Yeah? 
And if they do compassion, they wish all beings free from suffering, they'll enter to second level of concentration. And if they add impermanence or investigation the Dhamma, they add, become fifth. Yeah, so two and five. And same for appreciative joy, three and six. And uh, equanimity, four and seven. So you don't ask me why these numbers is in the sutta is like that. Huh? So it happened to be like that. <clears throat> so uh, this is for the four sublime states. So it can be uh, done with quite a wide spectrum of these levels of concentration. But in the Noble Eightfold Path, Noble Eightfold Path, the right concentration is just defined as the four jhanas. As the four jhanas. First and third four. Because, uh, so I just roughly introduced the first jhana. Uh, in theory, uh, in theory, we'll have four factors, four things to look out for. Uh, initial thinking, sustained thinking, joy and happiness. So this emotion is a package, it comes together. So normally a person enters first jhana and just ah, no, very soft, very nice, or quite pleasant, but don't know what's the difference. Because it's together. Then the second jhana, second level of concentration, will just have joy and happiness. So there's no more initial and sustained thinking. Yeah, so it's another pleasant uh, emotion. And the third jhana, the third level of concentration, will just have happiness and a bit of equanimity. So there are two factors, eh? happiness and equanimity. So no more joy. So the second one, second level of concentration have joy and happiness. The third one has happiness but no joy. So if a person wants to differentiate what's the difference between joy and happiness, they need to transit between the second and the third, or the third and the second. A process of elimination then. The different experience means the different emotion. Eh? And for the fourth level of concentration, it will be just one factor called equanimity. So these are the four levels of concentration. Eh? Uh, so the right concentration in the Eightfold Path is defined as these four uh, jhanas. So in the Buddha's time, before he got enlightened, he learned under two meditation teachers. <coughs> Two meditation teachers when he was before or uh, practicing ascetism. <clears throat> so the first uh, ascetic teacher, this Alara Kalama, taught him the seventh level of concentration. And there's a name to it called the realm of nothingness. <clears throat> realm of nothingness. So it's the, the combination of this uh, <clears throat> equanimity plus impermanence uh, may lead to this realm of nothingness. But of course, uh, uh, this ascetic teacher may not teach this uh, equanimity, lah, so he teach uh, maybe another method. Eh? So he reached this realm of nothingness. And of course, the ascetic Gautama, uh, he was not satisfied with this uh, realm of nothingness. The idea is, you want to have uh, Liberation means total peace, no total calmness, total quietness. But then, you know, they still need to makan, you know, they need to move around, they still need to go to the toilet, still there's movement. So something is wrong with the philosophy. Right? So he left the teacher, he went to the second teacher. So the second teacher is Udaka Ramaputta. So he taught him the highest level of jhana. So the eighth, eighth level of concentration. So this is called the Neither perception nor non-perception. Very confusing thing. So that is the uh, highest level of jhana. Yeah? So again, the same thing. Uh, uh, the Buddha or ascetic Gautama wasn't satisfied with that uh, state of mind, so he left. And so they left the school of freezing the karma and he went to the other school called burning the karma. So torturing himself. So freezing doesn't work, torturing doesn't work. So he found the middle way yeah, after six years of exploring, found the middle way. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, the other three kinds of samadhi. So the first one is all about jhanas. <clears throat> jhanas alone, uh, without right view and right thought, uh, cannot be called right concentration. It's just called jhanas. So there are many instances in the suttas where, let's say, yogis or practitioners that practice uh, some kind of jhana and they are reborn in certain Brahma realm 
that's the third heavenly realm because of the karma, the fruit of the jhanas. And after they use up the karma, if they still do not have right view, they use up the good karma, so left with all the bad karma. Yeah, so they need to be reborn in the lower realm. Yeah, the hell, the animal realm or whatever realm. Yeah? So this is the what happens if a person uh, do not have right view. Yeah, so uh, again in this Ratana Sutta, if a person uh, is a Sangha jewel, if they really realize the truth in their right view, they will not be reborn into the woeful states. Uh, no more hell, hungry ghosts, animal realm. Huh? Or they want to count this Ashura realm, huh? four woeful states. So um, <clears throat> these are the states they won't be reborn in. So this is the... Uh, if there's jhana with right view. So when the Buddha taught jhana, he always included everything, the Eightfold Path as a package. So if a person were to refer to this jhana sutta, the, each level of jhana, there's a reflection of this impermanence. Yeah, reflection. So there's a holy sorry, like not just impermanence, there's suffering, non-self, disease, cancer, error, whatever, huh? emptiness. So there's a whole list, you can just pick one and just reflect. So that's the, uh, the Buddha's version. So he added this reflection to make the jhana the right kind of concentration. Yeah, so that is the, the first kind. So that's the first type. And the second type of concentration is this uh, <clears throat> uh, concentration that leads to higher knowledge and vision. So in order to do that, a person has to visualize light. Their practice is to visualize light the whole day. So uh, there are many kinds of visualization practices. So in my routine, uh, I don't encourage, in my routine, I don't encourage for too long. Maybe other systems, other styles of meditation, they might teach that. Okay, so the knowledge, higher knowledge and vision is called abhinyas. Higher knowledge, yeah. So this is the uh, uh, something do like psychic power. So there are five kinds of worldly psychic power. Huh? First is this divine eye. Uh, some people can see ghosts or see devas. So that's the first kind of uh, higher knowledge. Huh? Second one is recalling past life. Recalling past life. Huh? You want to know what you are in the past. So that is the second kind of higher knowledge. Third one. Divine ear, and can hear long range or hear other realms. So that's the third one. <clears throat> the fourth one is this mind reading ability, eh? to know what other people are thinking. So that's the fourth one. And the fifth one is this, uh, like telekinesis, eh? can able to fly, can walk on water, walk through the walls, that kind of stuff. Yeah? So these are the five uh, worldly higher knowledges. And there's one more, the sixth one, is the higher knowledge that leads to liberation. Yeah, so there's a total of six higher knowledges. So the sixth one is uh, specially reserved for uh, enlightened beings, then they'll have the sixth one. Huh? So the first five can be achieved by anybody, any non-Buddhist, even non-practitioner can actually achieve these uh, first five higher knowledge. For example, some people are born for example, as a deva, so they immediately have this thing ready. They don't have to meditate for it. Right? If they do enough good deeds and they're born as a deva, they have the divine eye, divine whatever. So that is for them. Or some people born as a certain spirit, they also can see those other things, right? So that is uh, uh, born with it, might be got to do their physiology or certain special kind of genetics, whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> uh, humans also, some humans, a few humans may be able to. Uh, have this ability. Uh, some people claim to be able to see goals or see things and stuff like that when they are young or recall past lives. There are some documentaries on it. Um, <clears throat> so these are without training and for non-spiritual reasons also can be done. For example, uh, nowadays there's this thing called uh, past life regression therapy. Have you heard of it? So this is they somehow, they call it medically proven. You don't even need to meditate. You just need to pay money to these therapies and they hypnotize you. And you keep on asking, they keep on ask leading questions. They ask you, ask you, then you go to your subconsciousness. And somehow you can recall your past life. And then he's able to document down and 
very in very detail things that you do not even know, and uh, they have many cases on uh, on it lah. So they claim to be authentic. Yeah? So this is the uh, circular way uh, of uh, recalling past lives. Yeah, just by asking questions and stuff like that. So, um, so more non spiritual methods of this higher knowledge is this. Uh, I think quite quite recent, not really recent, uh, quite recent, uh, like the world, it's not the world war, it's uh, Cold War. Cold War between the US and the Russia. US and the Russia. So they have this special program you know, for the spies, for the psychic inclined spies. They call it remote viewing. Remote viewing. So there's certain special exercise for them to do their visualization, whatever not. Then afterwards, they can just stay in their room and then they can pinpoint the enemy target and they can just bomb the place. <laughs> and they can just bomb the place. Yeah, so there's such thing. So they don't have to be physically present to see the actual thing. They're just in the mind, they can see already. Yeah? So this is the, uh, we call it mundane higher knowledges, not for spiritual use. Yeah? So they can be used for very worldly mundane things, may not be wholesome even. Yeah? So that is the higher knowledges. <clears throat> So more people coming. <coughs> yeah, so um, um, so there are lots of um, uh, these uh, visualization practices. So for example, like uh, uh, in the Tibetan tradition, in the Tibetan tradition, before they uh, take up any initiation to visualize any particular deity or bodhisattva or, or any Buddha, they need to do some confession, confession practice, supposedly to purify the karma. Yeah? So they need to uh, <coughs> you know, do like thousands and thousands of prostrations or chant thousands and thousands of mantras to create enough good karma before they can really receive this practice, before they can receive instruction to visualize. Right and uh, so in case, in case they happen to develop this divine eye, eh? in case they happen to develop this divine eye, at least the things they see will be quite pleasant. At least because uh, in Buddhism we believe uh, wholesome beings will be attracted to good karma person. Yeah, if let's say you are wholesome, you will be appear bright to the devas. If you are unwholesome, you have a lot of negative karma, you appear dark. So the only things attracted to you are demons and evil spirits. Lah. So in the Theravada tradition, there's this lack of this practice, eh? lack of this confession practice. So you ask you, okay, see like, <laughs> okay. Then uh, if, if a person happened to develop this divine eye, and if they do not have enough good karma, then the whole day is a horror movie can be a horror movie. Huh? So the whole day they see demons and ghosts and evil spirit. So that might be one of the possible results. Huh? So uh, <clears throat> second, um, <clears throat> how do you call it? Um, so, so in the Thai, or rather not Thai, I think many Buddhist tradition, there are people who are okay or quite pro people developing this uh, divine eye or encourage people to see the light uh, and there are teachers who are against no, against this practice that means don't really encourage so in the scripture it is an official practice but personally i feel it is a case by case basis not meant for everybody eh? not meant for everybody so uh, one of the few factors to take note is uh, checklist for yourself is uh, first is can you handle you know, can you handle the dramas of this lifetime if you cannot handle the dramas of this lifetime uh, somebody maybe criticize you or some uh, incident happened and you feel depressed or upset then seeing past life may not be suitable for for that person eh? that practice of developing or visualizing may not be suitable for that person uh, if one lifetime you cannot handle, you want to look at you know, how many lifetimes and you multiply the effect, right? you cannot handle. So you may not have the wisdom or the concentration to handle it. Okay, second criteria is um, uh, our own spiritual tendencies, our sort of our inclination and right view. 
Right? That means because this ability is a bit like the supernatural version of YouTube. Yeah? Supernatural version of Google or YouTube. So if a person uh, do not have this uh, right intention, they end up trying to capo a lot of things. Yeah? So in order to know uh, whether you're suitable, you have to check your internet search history. Yeah? Check your internet search history. If your search history is full of rubbish and full of entertainment, and forget it, <laughs> don't go and visualize. If you happen to have divine eye, then your whole day is, uh, whole day is uh, no, kind of uh, sidetrack. Uh, you never come back to your meditation, come back to you know, gay or other thing. So personally, I have encountered uh, two monks who this rope, two monks who this rope because of this uh, visualization related kind of meditation. So the first monk I encountered was uh, when I was a junior monk. He was more senior than me by seven years. So he was, uh, he claimed to be able to sit and not move for 14 hours. 14 hours straight. He don't need to get up from his seat. 14 hours. So what was he doing there? 14 hours VR, uh, virtual reality. So whole day, see all those things, uh, interacting with those unseen beings. 14 hours. So nowadays the kids also can stay with the computer for... <laughs> For how many hours? So he can do that. Yeah, 14 hours sit there, then he do his own VR thing. Uh, I mean, supernatural VR. So, um, but he's gone to the extent of his blur the vision between the different realms. No, he cannot differentiate what is uh, this reality and uh, whatever he's seen. Yeah, so sometimes uh, he may act very strangely. Act very strangely. Huh? Um, like sometimes like in the Thai forest, he can just walk off you know, to the forest and he get lost. And people need to form a search party to look for him huh? until like that for days. Uh, then some other incident was uh, like when a group of monks were like in a lorry, a pickup, a moving pickup, moving truck, he can suddenly just jump off. <laughs> jump off. Huh? So he do a lot of those funny, funny things. So in the end, he uh, disrobe lah. Because of some issue. So I think he's gonna diagnose with some mental issue huh, in this room. Then the second one was uh, not mental illness, but the second one is um, uh, he did the visualization. So once he's able to perceive certain spirits, then he this room and become a Taoist priest. Yeah, because monk cannot catch ghosts, but the other occupation can catch ghosts. Huh? So, he disrobed, huh? then he want to go and full time become this priest. Huh? So uh, that is because if a person do not have the interest in finding this uh, middle path, then a lot of things can distract you. So very important. Um, so in my routine, we don't encourage very long kind of visualization. Yeah, very long kind of visualization. So that's uh, the point. So in, uh, we talk about the different teachers in the different, uh, let's say the Thai tradition, those who are pro and against, for example, like the <coughs> forest tradition, the founder of the forest tradition, Long Pu Man, his biography talks about, oh, you bring Chan Bhutto and you can see the bright light, then later you see all the devas, all the whatever, nagas and whatever, right? So uh, that's for him. So his disciples also have a different spectrum. Like for example, maybe Ajahn Cha, he's not really into seeing those bright light. Uh, some of his uh, this account of disciples asking him in the meditation, uh, Long Po, right? I ask Ajahn Chah, Long Po, I can see white light in my meditation. No, what does it mean? And his reaction is to take out his torchlight and shine, <laughs> shine at that person. And he say, my torchlight also got light. Eh? So his Ajahn Chah is more of the, maybe the wisdom kind, he's not really into all this. Uh, so what is implying is that probably um, the light don't really mean anything. It's how you reflect, how you discern the light. And uh, <clears throat> so that's for the Ajahn Chai is on the Mahanikaya side. So let's say for the <clears throat> Dhamma Yud side, um, I always take reference from the scriptures from Ajahn Tani Saru, eh? Ajahn Jeff. So he's the uh, uh, American monk, he's a Caucasian monk. He's the, probably the first Caucasian to go to Thailand to take the Pali examinations in the Thai language and pass and he got the highest grade. So he's the first Caucasian to do that. Yeah? So he has two teachers. 
or the supposedly two teachers he acknowledged. So one is uh, Ajahn Lee. So Ajahn Lee is uh, uh, very in favor of this supernatural kind of thing. And then he has another teacher called uh, Long Fu Fong. Long Fu Fong is against, kind of against this kind of phenomena. Yeah? So uh, there's a story of uh, Long Fu Fong, F-U-A-N-G, yeah? Long Fu Fong. Uh, he's an abbot of a certain monastery and uh, <coughs> there's a Meiji staying in the monastery. Yeah? That means uh, a preceptor lady staying there to do all the temple maintenance. Yeah? So uh, the more she stayed, the longer she stayed, she observed all those uh, retreats, you know, those uh, people that come for retreats, maybe for a while, like what, what you're doing, stay for a while. Then some of the retreat participants start to say, oh, they can see this, see that in the meditation, see the different lights and you know, all of amazing, fantastic things. And then she went to ask the abbot, uh, this Long Po Fong, ask, uh, Dear Long Po, uh, uh, I stay with you uh, for so many years, I never see anything. But this meditator <laughs> come for a while, then they claim they can see this, see that. Uh, what's wrong? What's wrong with my meditation? Uh, so this Long Po Fong straight away tell her, you are so lucky, <laughs> you are so fortunate. Uh, do you know that uh, all these people that see all these things, I'm so worried for them. Uh, so worried for them, like uh, like the examples I gave her, because some of those things can happen. Yeah, so uh, for those who cannot see anything, uh, very good. Okay, so um, <clears throat> possible reasons for people to be able to see this light is because they themselves are practicing this visualization practice. Because that itself is to to develop this divine eye. Yeah? So if a person has certain divine eye potential, then uh, there are a few possibilities if they happen to see light occurring naturally. A few possibilities. Huh? So possibility number one, it could be this uh, physical light. Maybe our eye is very thin. So in order to I mean, process of elimination, you want to know whether it's a physical light or some supernatural light. You just use your hand, cover your eye. Eh? So additional blockage. If the light is gone, that means it's a physical light. Second possibility, it could be uh, really a divine eye. So you perceive the mind in terms of brightness. So if a person's mind has more concentration or calmer, it will appear brighter. So basically, you see yourself. So that's a possibility. Eh? You see your own mind. Uh, then another possibility, it could be other unseen beings capable, they fly past only. Other unseen beings. So other unseen beings may appear bright, now, yeah, but they don't want to show their form, now. they just fly past. So so that is another possibility. So next time you want to see again, hey, what happened to the light? They don't appear because they don't want to come. Right? So uh, that one is beyond beyond the control. If they come, means have, they don't come, means don't have like that. Not, yeah? So that is uh, another possibility. So yeah, these are amongst a few possibilities. Um, yeah, so that's about this uh, divine eye. So the third one, the, okay, so the, the second kind of uh, samadhi, uh, this higher knowledge and vision, uh, to further develop it, you can find this in this uh, Idi Pada Vibhanga Sutta, four bases of psychic power. Yeah, so um, when the Buddha, when the Buddha, before he passed away, this Mahaparinibbana Sutta, uh, he have a special uh, request, or rather he can make a request to this Venerable Ananda. He told Venerable Ananda, if any practitioner who is mastered these four bases of psychic power, four bases of power, can actually live to an eon. Can actually live to an eon. So this eon is subjective to interpretation. Huh? How long is this eon? That means they can live in suspended animation. So like some people think meditation means must uh, suspend the animation, cannot breathe, cannot, uh, no heart beating and stuff like that. So that is the kind of meditation. So a lot of those Hindu yogis, uh, some of them have the practice of like, staring at the sun or staring at the moon. So all these are like visualization practices. Huh? So when they visualize, visualize, so they may have this kind of uh, power. Huh? So they end up not breathing and stuff like that. So very common to find uh, some yogis can meditate long term, don't need to eat, don't need to whatever, you know, this uh, suspended animation and stuff like that. So that's the kind of 
meditation they are doing. Lah. So, uh, basis of psychic power. Eh? So, that's the second kind. <clears throat> uh, the third, uh, third kind is uh, mindfulness. So, if a person keep observing impermanence, arising and passing of these uh, your thoughts, your feelings and uh, perceptions and all these will sharpen one's mindfulness. So, that's the third kind of concentration. So, actually, vipassana is a kind of samadhi. <laughs> vipassana done long or done correctly is a kind of samadhi. We call this vipassana samadhi. It is not jhanas. It's different. Different from jhanas. Eh? Okay, then the fourth kind of samadhi, the fourth category is, if a person continue to do number three, it will lead to the eradication of the affluence and defilements. So if a person is um, enlightened or close to enlightened, they'll experience the fourth kind of samadhi. So some people call it effortless samadhi. And that means they don't have to do anything, the mind naturally at peace. So that's the best. People like to do nothing. So that, the instruction for do nothing is meant for them. <laughs> These are the people, the mind pure already. So they don't have to do anything. Yeah, they just observe their awareness. Some people say, observe your mind, observe your awareness. Uh, they can observe their awareness because their awareness is pure. They just observe. So for those who are still not pure, we need to observe the impermanence of our awareness. Impermanence of the consciousness. Impermanence of the five aggregates. Yeah? For those who are pure. So it's like uh, in other religions, maybe Hinduism, their definition of consciousness equals to pure consciousness. No? The pure citta. Yeah, so some of the, uh, my own hypotheses eh, of uh, how come there's such instructions. Eh? Nowadays, very popular. Just stay with your awareness. Observe your awareness. Something like that, right? You heard before this instruction? Have, eh? Yeah, so my hypothesis is that maybe some realized master or some enlightened master is meditating or doing nothing. Then this uh, student is asking him, uh, what do you do for meditation or what are you doing? And this enlightened master is like, I just stay in my awareness. Lah. Because he finished his job already, right? he just stay with his awareness. Then the student is like, oh, stay with the awareness. Lah. Okay, then he teach all the other students, stay with your awareness. Stay with your awareness. So it's like, there must be a process to reach this pure awareness. You cannot just stay with your awareness. So that's meant for enlightened person. Yeah, and like the mind pure already, you can stay with the awareness. So for those who are still training, you cannot just stay with the awareness. You stay with the awareness if you, let's say you, you have angry mind, you just stay with angry mind. You get more angry mind. <laughs> you, you just stay with that emotion. Because emotion is addictive. You need a kind of right reflection to counter and overcome this unwholesome state of mind. Eh? So that is the idea. Okay, so that's the four kinds of samadhi. So hopefully I explained. Does that answer your previous query? Yeah. Okay, alright. Yourself? Okay, yeah, so that's in theory only, huh? In theory. Okay. Anybody want to ask anything? No, it's a QA session, huh? Well, yeah. I think that the light comes, the QA comes. Okay. So I, I can feel it from the one the pain. Okay. I can the pain. Okay. okay. Alright. So you did some steps first before the light appeared, right? Ah, so. Because I use mine like that. Mm. I don't like that last time. Okay, okay. So I use Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah, so, so if, uh, uh, the, depending on which style you're doing, if let's say you're following my routine, then you just stay with the meditation object, and then you treat everything as just uh, byproduct. Huh? Right, uh, anything else? Anyone want to ask questions? Any issues with the practice? Any problem? Yeah. Yeah, if it's too painful, uh, 
uh, first you try to to go back to the meditation object. Uh, if you can go back and you can ignore, then okay. But if let's say the pain is too strong, uh, too excruciating pain, then uh, uh, there are many methods. First is the samatha way, which is to ignore, which I mentioned already. Then next is the vipassana method. At first, uh, we can think of impermanence. Impermanence of the feeling. If that still doesn't go away, then you slowly change. Never mind, it's okay. And there's no point uh, fighting and create aversion, aversion, and you hold it aversion, then uh, it becomes a suffering meditation. So you move mindfully, but uh, have this uh, right thought. Lah, yeah? okay. So we are not training to be statues. Eh? We are not training to be statues. So I like to quote this uh, Ajahn Chah, you know, he made a statement. Uh, he talked about meditation or mental cultivation is not about sitting long hours. It's not about sitting long hours. If it is so, then all the chicken that is hibernating the egg, they can sit very long, right? So they should be enlightened. Or this uh, frog, you know, they lie down, <laughs> they sit for very long, they can be enlightened maybe, yeah? So it's not about sitting long. It's about the software, what you think. So there are many disciples of the Buddha that got enlightened or they purified the mind without long sitting. They can be doing other things, doing their chores and they got enlightened. Eh? Yeah, so one of the case is this uh, Venerable Sivali. Venerable Sivali is the monk foremost in receiving gifts. Foremost in receiving gifts. So in Palilai Temple, is a monk carrying the umbrella and the statue. Huh? So he's the monk foremost in receiving gifts. So uh, it is believed that uh, right before his ordination, right before his ordination, uh, this Buddha asked Venbo Sariputta to shave his head for him, huh? shave the head of this Sivari. So while shaving, this uh, Venerable Sariputta is uh, asking him to contemplate on the impermanence of the hair. So he contemplated and by shaving, then eventually quite enlightened. Just by shaving the hair. Yeah, shaving the hair can get enlightened. Yeah? So he don't need to sit uh, long, long hours. <laughs> so he sit long, long hours, like no effect. Yeah? So that's why the Eightfold Path or this cultivation uh, includes uh, dana also. Uh, these thoughts of non-greed. So like this Venerable Sivali is uh, kind of quite perfected his, uh, his non-greed. Yeah, so when the mind is very calm, very peaceful, very stable or quite pure, then it's easy to uh, resonate with uh, impermanence, easy to absorb, easy, easy to understand the truth. Yeah, so merit is uh, important, and the full part, everything is important. Okay. Anyone else want to ask anything? What's the time? Seven fifty. Still have time. <clears throat> yeah, eight o'clock is uh, guided meditation. So if you don't have anything, so we give. Uh, 10 minute break, you can do your stretching or toilet. Opportunity you have, uh, whoever you think can help you, then by all means you learn. And uh, once uh, you learn until like maximum ready, and you still think, hey, cannot learn from that person anymore, then uh, yeah, you still can be friends, then you, you know, find another teacher. Lah. And I think that's what the, the Buddha and his great disciples did. Oh, I think that's what the Samanas did in the Buddha's time. Uh, they call the truth seekers. So anybody who claims to know the truth or able to teach something higher, then they just switch teacher. Nah. Yeah. So the whole idea is to find the truth. Nah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the rough yeah, idea. So I think I went through a particular sutta in the MSBS. I've forgotten the title. <laughs> But there, there is a sutta to check the different criteria for the teacher and stuff like that. Um, so I think the Tibetan tradition, they expanded on it. Uh, they call the lamb ring or something, yeah.
anyone else? Okay, if no one, then we start first. Let me just give a clock already. <coughs> okay, so tonight session uh, <coughs> um, is a bit of visualization, uh, a bit only. So we call this uh, Asubha meditation, impurities of the body meditation. Ah, okay, so that's nice coming in. So impurities of the body meditation, um, we just do external parts of the body. Eh? Your have the head, have the body, nails, teeth and skin. These things. You don't have to do the internal parts and stuff like that. Now, how many of you have seen your internal organs before? Your own internal organs. Ever, right? Yeah, so we just do the parts that we see frequently and we are most attached. Like. Uh, so that's the thing we do. And uh, we don't have to go too deep, we don't have to uh, uh, over-visualize, like for example, think of your teeth fall off, you know, you think, oh yeah, I got blood, la, <laughs> or stuff like that. I don't have to over-dramatize. Eh? Okay, so uh, very simple uh, exercise. The same concept, we are going to use uh, loving kindness followed by impermanence. So we are going to understand how uh, right thought uh, can is applicable in all kinds of meditation objects. Eh? So we start off uh, with finding a comfortable sitting kind of posture. <coughs> Make sure our back is upright, rest of the body relax. Okay, so we <coughs> practice this uh, detachment to the body. Uh, first, visualizing all the hairs, eh? like imagining, like looking at yourself in the mirror like that. So you look at all the hairs from head to toe. And by looking at the hairs itself, by thinking of the hairs itself, there's no Dhamma value. Eh? If your hair appears nice, good looking or beautiful, then you have greed. Lah. I like my hair, eh? so you have greed. Or if you find your hair ugly or... Uh, uh, dirty, out of fashion, then you may develop anger, aversion. So that is uh, the other extreme. So in all Dharma practice, you have to find a middle path, avoid both extremes. Eh? So the first thing we are doing is using loving kindness to overcome anger. So when you visualize any patch of hair, then you wish it well and happy. New patch of hair again, wish it well and happy. So we do this uh, very brief scanning from head to toe. Yeah, new patch of hair, well and happy. New patch of hair, well and happy. So the phrasing also important. Yeah, you wish the hairs well and happy, not wish my hairs. You don't go and add the I in there. My hair. So we are trying to overcome ego, and if you add the ego, then it's like a bit counterproductive. The concept of right thought and right effort still uh, applies. A new patch of hair means a uh, new condition for clinging. And think of a new image means new condition for clinging. So you must keep on applying right thought. New hairs, well and happy. New patch of hair, well and happy. If let's say you're doing it correctly, the uh, mind should get calmer. That's an indicator you're in the right direction. If the more you think, the more excited or more tension, it means something is wrong. Huh?
if you find your mind relatively calm, uh, of course in your own time you can do as long as you want to find how calm your mind can get. So for now we just use the relative calmness and we can switch to impermanence. Yeah, so all these hairs are subject to birth, aging, sickness and passing away. So you think of the hairs growing and falling, growing and falling, many many cycles. And as we keep looping this image, uh, do not over-dramatize. Eh? Don't have to think of what shampoo you're using, what kind of comb, what kind of conditioner. Just think of hairs growing and falling. And as you keep looping this image, then we can reflect on the impermanent nature of the five aggregates and eh? investigate. So the form, form aggregate is the hairs, when the hair grow and uh, no, fall, grow and fall, so the form is always changing. Eh? And when the form changes, uh, what happens to the feeling? Feeling is pleasant, new, uh, unpleasant, neutral feelings. When you have a new hair, what kind of feeling? When you've got old hair, what kind of feeling? And if you have a falling hair, what kind of feeling do you have? And then you have this thing called perception, third aggregate. So perception is basically all the past memories, all the labels. And you give a label to the image. Or when you need to uh, refer to a past image to reconstruct whatever you're visualizing. So that is using perception, huh? memory. So is that image of the hairs an exact photocopy of your actual hair? And do you have total photographic memory? And is the image exactly the same? Is your perception reliable? labels, the words, uh, the forming of the thoughts, and the forming of the words, forming of the images, we call this mental formation. And you generate a new image, that's a new mental formation. And when we pay attention to that image, we call that consciousness or the awareness and we can, uh, we have these uh, six kinds of consciousness and eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. So that visualizing is the mind door consciousness. So in between two images, what happened to that consciousness? Does it always stay in the mind door consciousness or does it jump around or what happened? can ask ourselves, are these hairs truly self? Or the more you practice impermanence and detachment, you can observe is the sense of self increasing or decreasing? Is the ego you know, intensifying or reducing?
and the next part of the body we're going to visualize all the nails fingernails and toenails and we wish them well and happy and all these nails fingernails and toenails are subject to birth, aging, sickness and passing away. So you think of them growing and falling, growing and falling, many, many cycles. And as we keep looping this image, Looking this process, we can observe the impermanent nature of the five aggregates. Now we need the five aggregates to perceive the nails. So when we meditate on the nails, we are not training the nails. Huh? The nails don't become uh, longer or become shinier. So we're actually training the mind eh, to detach from the nails. So if a person keep uh, putting effort and uh, keep on thinking of impermanence, <clears throat> the this particular routine uh, of these uh, impurities in the body doesn't lead to jhanas. Eh? So it leads to this impermanent kind of concentration, this uh, sharpening of this mindfulness. So no matter what emotion you experience, uh, emphasis is on rowing the boat, keep on thinking of impermanence, everything else is uh, byproduct, passing scenery. Huh? And we can observe then this uh, sense of self. Is it uh, increasing or decreasing? And we can 
ask ourselves that are these nails truly self? Can we tell the nails not to go through birth and death? So next we are going to observe this uh, so-called impermanent nature of the self. Huh? So then we are going to switch to the next part of the body when we don't think of impermanence, what will happen to the self again, huh? the sense of self? So now we're going to think of the teeth. All the teeth inside the mouth, may they be well and happy. All the upper rows of teeth and lower rows of teeth, may they be well and happy. So this uh, sense of self is a bit like a cement inside a concrete mixer. You need to think of impermanence to uh, start churning and then become like liquid. Eh? Once you stop thinking, once you stop impermanence, then it will like solidify or use the metaphor the stream. Once you stop rowing and then. Uh, you follow the direction of the current. Okay, so now we're going to think of impermanent nature of the teeth. All the teeth are subject to birth, aging, sickness, and passing away. And we think of them growing and falling, growing and falling, many, many cycles. Even though the teeth fall off the most twice only, we can keep repeating. And this is just a mental detachment exercise. Keep looping this image, we can investigate the impermanent nature of the five aggregates. So only the looping of the image is imaginary. Eh? All the other cognitive processes are your real-time evidence. And the change in the feelings, that's observable evidence
And we can ask ourselves, are these teeth truly self? Can we tell the teeth not to go through this birth and death? If so, you get the... Uh, hopefully you can catch the pattern huh, between Samatha, that means uh, wishing the part of the body well and happy, and when you transit to Vipassana, I right, think of impermanent nature of the part of the body, there will trigger certain phenomena, huh? or very similar phenomena. So it applies to all meditation objects. Okay, so we are now thinking of the skin. We wish all the skin well and happy. So from head to toe, every patch of skin, we wish them well and happy. All the skin are subject to birth, aging, sickness, and passing away. And so you think of skin growing and falling, growing and falling, many, many cycles. And as we keep looping this process, we can observe the arising and passing of the five aggregates.
you then we can ask ourselves how this skin truly self we tell the skin not to go through this birth and death then you can now experiment uh, any image a non-living thing uh, can be your mobile gadget can be your car whatever it is can be your cash your favorite object non-living object you just visualize that object uh. You see whether this uh, sense of possessiveness, sense of self, or this, this is mine, this is uh, uh, ego appear. So we're going to tackle this with uh, thoughts of loving kindness first. I wish that image well and happy. The very wish my thing well and happy uh, and conquest. I uh, wish that formation well and happy, that mental formation well and happy. And all these uh, <coughs> objects yeah, are subject to impermanence and yeah, birth and decay. So we can think of this uh, decaying process, how it uh, can dirty and decompose. If it's made of plastic, you can fast forward the process and you can loop this process many many times yeah? so we can renew again and keep getting old and decompose and new again and decompose yeah? Keep looping this process, you observe the arising and passing of the five aggregates. So the investigation of five aggregates is to deter the mind from straying too far, over dramatizing. The mind will tend to start to create Hollywood movie afterwards. Eh? So focus is on the looping and the investigation of the five aggregates. So if you get carried away by the dramas and stories, the Hollywood film your mind is creating, then we call this craving to sensual pleasure. Huh? So 
although we may observe this uh, preset, right? avoid this entertainment, whatever not. So ultimately, this is the very refined entertainment in the mind, cannot control. Right? So this one have to overcome only through real contentment. So when the mind is more contented, there's an incentive not to chase over this uh, imagination. Basically the mind is, will just chase the strongest emotion, that's all. And then we can ask ourselves, are uh, these objects, uh, the one that we're imagining, are they truly yours? Is it truly yours? Can you tell it not to go through decay? then we can come back to this uh, impermanence, sorry, mindful of these uh, four elements again, back to the body. So now on, don't need to visualize that. So whatever sensation appear, we should well and happy. New sensation arise, we should well and happy. Boy, wish you well and happy. You observe whether the calming process is it the same or similar. Eh? So that's the samatha phase. You find your mind relatively calm. This is the we call it the baseline emotion. Huh? No, no jhana concentration yet. And now we're going to think of impermanence. Huh? It's like restricted within the body, but impermanence. So 
So all these sensations, observe how they arise, how they pass away. So this is a real-time evidence, no imagination, no need to uh, speculate or imagine anything. Huh? Movement, any change in feeling, change in sensation, you keep observing and noting, um, intentional labeling, I call it change, arising, passing. So you can be mindful of um, right thought, impermanence the whole day in all activities, standing, sitting, walking or lying down. Eh? With that, we can gently open our eyes, formally end the session, informally still can practice uh, mindfulness of the body, <coughs> impermanence of the body. Eh? Okay, so it's 40 minutes of sitting. Uh, any questions at the moment? Any issues, any problem? Who cannot visualize anything? Cannot. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, okay. Maybe too tired. Ah, uh. uh, okay, okay. Okay, let me still uh, we say there's some attachment. Eh? Uh, it's normal if your first time retreat, right? So uh, uh, it's okay probably after some time to see how much improvement, uh, how much detachment you have. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so you, let's say a person is uh, drowsy eh? or feeling tired in meditation. Um, some of the possibilities uh, you can do. Uh, I always normally refer to this uh, Chapala Sutta, C A P A L A. It's not the Chapala, it's uh, Chapala Sutta. So, in this story of this uh, venerable Moggallana, uh, is the left hand man of the Buddha, uh, foremost in uh, psychic power. Huh? And before he got enlightened, when he's meditating, he's uh, always nodding, huh? meditating and sleeping. Uh, tired. So this uh, Buddha happened to pass by and uh, uh, gave him some tips la, how to improve on this uh, meditation, on this uh, overcome the drowsiness. So the first thing is do not pay attention to the drowsiness. So that's the idea, uh, the Buddha's advice to Venerable Moggallana. Do not pay attention to the drowsiness. So that's number one. Do not entertain, do not pay attention to drowsiness because the sleepy feeling, very nice, <laughs> very nice. Yeah, it's, uh, any strong emotion, any of the five hindrances, very strong emotion, very addictive emotion. So if our Kung Fu not good enough, if we pay attention to it, very high percentage will get sucked into it. It's like a whirlpool, huh? like a tornado. So the best is avoid it, do not go into the tornado, conquest. Huh? 
So avoid the tornado, go far, far away, go somewhere. So what to do? So the first thing is uh, increase the rate of your investigation. So if let's say we're investigating impermanence, you investigate faster, lah. that means you observe impermanence more. Eh? So that is one way. If let's say you observe, observe, investigate, you can fall asleep. Uh, then <coughs> another possibility is have this Dhamma discussion in your mind. Dhamma talk in your mind. So your Dhamma talk, Dhamma talk, when you still can fall asleep, uh, then you have do chanting. Do chanting. Eh? Uh, like any favorite chant, you can chant. But if you see in a group, you don't chant out loud. Like you chant in your mind. Eh? You know, people think you have a problem. Eh? So you chant in your mind. If that still doesn't work, so you can fall asleep, uh, then you have other options. So like for Denver Mogalina, he had this instruction, visualize white light. So brightening this light can help you, uh, make you wakeful. Uh. And so that's why he got this psychic power. Uh. Um, so if that still doesn't work, so you can fall asleep, then you have even grosser method. So you have things like, uh, you know, rubbing your face, pulling your ear, uh, washing your face, right? Stuff like that. So the last resort is walking. If let's say you walk, so you can ping sun, right? so you can uh, fall off, means you're really tired. Uh, then you should go and lie down. Lie down mindfully. Yeah? So that's the like whole spectrum of advice for drowsiness. So I know very tired. <laughs> End of the day really. So uh, this is, you can, um, by deduction, you know, it's tiredness. Lah, huh? Okay, so um, any issues you want to ask? <clears throat> if not, I hand over to the organizers to uh, brief on the next day program, like the cleaning and stuff like that. <clears throat> you want to say something?